Welcome folks. We're going to get started in just um, probably an, another minute. I am recording today's session because it is a workshop we don't off, offer very often. So I am recording today's session. I also sent you all a, a copy of the slides um, just a couple minutes before the session started. So we'll get started very shortly. Rearranging my screen. Okay, we may have a few more folks join us and I'll let them in as they um, as they start to come in. But welcome. Thank you guys so much for joining me on a Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Vicki Dominic and I am a learning specialist in learning services. Um, today's topic is what is ADD, ADHD? Today's session is being recorded and I have activated live transcription. The transcription is done by artificial intelligence, so it may not be perfect, but um, you might find it helpful. Um, and I can also see if my sound goes out or something happens if I see the transcription stop. To tell you a little bit about what we do in learning services. So we're here to support students learning and we do that through several services. One is, of course, these academic success workshops. And I think we have like 18 or 20 different top 18 or 20, 18 or 19 different topics related to study strategies and learning and even things like sleep, because sleep is so essential for learning. Um, and we have about three workshops a week, every week in fall and spring, and then two weeks work, two workshops a week in the summer when summer classes are in session. Um, you can register on Mason 360 as you all have done today. Um, and if there's a workshop topic you're interested in and you can't make that time, you can always um, schedule an individual appointment to go over the information um, from the session. The other service that we provide is individual academic coaching. And in academic coaching, what we do is work with you on some short-term goals. So if you want to you know, improve your performance on exams, you want more efficient ways to read because you have a lot of reading in your classes, you need help putting together um, a time management plan so that you can balance um, school and work and your personal life, um, we can do that in academic coaching. So what you do is you make an appointment online, it's through Navigate Mason, and you can schedule an appointment on our webpage. So you just go to learningservices.gmu.edu. Um, and then in the upper right hand corner of our webpage, it says make an appointment. You click that, it's going to ask for your Mason credentials. And then you're going to pick tutoring, testing, and learning assistance. Academic coaching would fall under the learning assistance piece. And from there, you'll be able to schedule an appointment with a coach. Um, there is also something on campus called success coaching. That's more long-term goal setting. That's more like a mentoring program, like your success coach. You can see your success coach throughout your time here at Mason. Um, whereas academic coaching, it's really focused on time management and study strategies, and it's meant to be a little bit more short-term. 
Now, let's say you want some tips on time management and you can't make a workshop and maybe you don't want to schedule an appointment. Again, check out our web page um, or our YouTube channel, which is like Mason Learning. Um, and we've got videos available on there where you can watch some, some tips, either videos we produced or videos that we've linked to. And then finally, um, I maintain a list of tutoring resources on campus. So I don't oversee any tutoring at the university, but it can be really confusing because we've got tutors who are called peer mentors, like in um, Vogeno, and we've got consultants in the Writing Center and um, learning assistants in the College of Science. So they go by different names. So I started compiling that list for my staff, and then ultimately we, we've put that information onto um, our webpage. But if you have a question about chemistry tutoring, you'll need to contact the chemistry department about that. If there's not a tutor available for your subject, um, it may make sense to make an appointment for academic coaching. Because we're teaching folks how to learn, you can use those strategies in any of your classes, okay? Um, so yeah, think about that if you need some assistance. And if you have any questions about tutoring, you can always email me. And if I know about a resource, I will be happy to um, point you in the right direction. All right, so some learning outcomes for today's session. I'm gonna define ADD, ADHD, um, talk about some of the symptoms. I'm gonna provide you with some facts about ADHD. We'll talk briefly about the causes, how it is assessed, um, some strategies, and here I listed as interventions, but some strategies to mitigate some of those, the symptoms, um, some issues that college students can face, and then we'll we'll do some some more strategies specific to that like things that learning services um, recommends for students with ADD or ADHD. So let's start by talking about what is ADHD. So this is a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. Now, back in the day, they used to say attention deficit disorder, ADD, for people who had inattention issues, and then um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, for folks who had primarily hyperactivity issues. And now it's kind of, we use the umbrella term of ADHD for both types. Um, or for combined type, which has um, symptoms of both inattention and the hyperactivity piece. So what symptoms might look like for this? Not working up to your potential. Might have like a high IQ, but classes, class performance is not what would be expected, like class performance and getting C's and D's. Uh, folks tend to be consistently late to appointments, classes, work. Can also involve some impulsive spending. Difficulties organizing, and that can be organizing time, organizing ma physical materials. Um, I've seen some students like their stuff is falling out of their bag or their backpack. And it can also lead to conflict with others, you know, conflict with roommates, peers, family members, um, co-workers at a job. The other thing that's not on here um, is also um, frequent minor car accidents. Um, because driving requires a lot of focus and attention. Um, sometimes folks with ADHD will um, tend to have some minor car accidents because they're, they're distracted and not necessarily paying attention. All right, so what it can sound like. So these are things that um, folks sometimes will say. I sit and read, but I get to the end of the page and I have no idea what I just read. My friends can sit in the library for three hours and study. I just wander around the rows of books until they're ready to leave. My mom used to wake me up every morning for school. Now I forget to set an alarm clock and I miss my class. So as I started to talk about, there are 
three presentations, predominantly inattentive, pre predominantly hyperactive slash impulsive, and then there's combined where it has traits of both. So I'm gonna post up a poll and it's very brief. There's like three questions. Hang on, find my poll. There. Now I just need the right poll. Here we go. So there's just three questions. Take your best guess. And at this, the poll is anonymous, so nobody's going to see what your response is. Take your best guess on what you think the answers are. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the results of the poll. Thank you guys so much for participating in that. All right, so for the first question, children outgrow ADHD. You guys are rock stars. That is false. We used to think back in the day, I say we, as if I was around. Um, they used to think back in the day that ADHD was a childhood disorder and that people just outgrew it. Um, but we know now from research that it's really common if folks had an ADHD um, diagnosis as children, they still have um, significant symptoms as adults. There are some folks who don't, just, don't seem to be having as much issue with symptoms in adulthood. Part of this is because ADHD is, it's related to like being a developmental delay. Right, so it's where a child who's maybe eight year old, eight years old, has the attention span of a five year old. So over time, they either improve or they maybe come up with some strategies to manage their symptoms. Um, but they estimate that about nine point five percent of children have ADHD, and that about four point four percent of adults still have significant symptoms. All right, so now the next one was kind of like, I kind of misled you a little. So you, everybody who put this, who put your answers, you're all right. Um, it's very common for people with ADHD to also have anxiety. It's estimated that 25 to 40% of adults who have ADHD also have anxiety. And part of this can be from the stress of trying to like, manage their, their focus and attention, not pulling through on responsibilities, having conflict with others. So it's really common for ADHD and anxiety to go hand in hand. The other thing that's common is depression. In fact, it's even more common. About 70% of folks with ADHD may suffer from depression at some point. About, it's estimated about 15.4% of children with ADHD also have a learning disability. And finally, people with ADHD are two to three times more likely to have a sleep disorder um, because it can be hard sometimes to, for the, the person's brain to like at night, their, their mind might be going a mile a minute. So it can be hard to like calm down and, and get to sleep and get restful sleep along with that. I'm gonna stop sharing my poll. Who can diagnose ADHD? Well, for this one, 
all of these folks, except for a chiropractor, can diagnose. So a pediatrician or a childhood doctor, a psychologist, a psychologist is somebody who has a PhD or um, that they might have a doctorate of psychology. Um, and then a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor who has specialized training in mental health issues. So any of these three folks can diagnose ADHD, um, but a chiropractor is not qualified and does not have the training to um, test and provide a diagnosis for that. But all the other folks that are listed on here can. So folks are like, well, if it's a childhood thing, how could somebody possibly get to college and not know that they have ADHD? And it's actually more common than you might think. And it's actually really common for people, maybe even not in college, to get diagnosed as adults when they take their children in for an assessment and they're listening to the symptoms and they say, gosh, that sounds just like me. Um, and so people do get diagnosed in adulthood. But specifically getting diagnosed in college, there are um, a lot of reasons. One, high school tends to be really structured. You know, you start high school at a specific time. There's a bell to tell you when to go to class, when to be in class. Um, your teacher's always reminding you of work that needs to be done. Your parents usually have access to the, um, the online course uh, platform so they can see if you're late on an assignment and, and remind you to get that done. So there's a lot of structure in high school that can mitigate ADHD symptoms. Um, the other is that there's not as much structure in college. And for many students, this is the first time that they are away from home. Um, so you don't have class now from I'm trying to remember, we think we started at 7.30 in the morning. We had class, I think, from 7.30 to like 2.30 in the afternoon. And it was like blocks and you went all day. And now you could have a 9 a.m. class on one day and then a 1.30 p.m. class on a Tuesday. Uh, and you're only in class physically for 15 hours a week. If you, if you have a face-to-face -face in real time class, um, you're only in class usually about 15 hours a week. So there's a lot of unstructured time. And that can be difficult for folks to manage. And then if this is if you're living away from home, if you're living on campus or in an apartment and you're not living with family members any longer, um, family may have provided a lot of structure, like what time to get up in the morning. Um, they may help with meal preparation, um, you know, driving, providing transportation to events and things. And now you get here and it's like you're responsible for getting yourself up and getting to class and remembering to eat um, and you know, figuring out transportation, like how do I use the shuttle to get to the Metro? You gotta figure that stuff out on your own. So the symptoms for like the inattention piece, this means often feeling to give close attention to details or making careless mistakes. Now, everybody does this from time to time, especially when we're sleep deprived or we're stressed. Okay, so it's really common um, having trouble sustaining attention in, during activities um, may seem like they're not listening. Sometimes doesn't follow instructions or does it like will maybe start an assignment but not finish it. Having uh, trouble organizing stuff, as I had mentioned earlier, may be reluctant to engage in activities that are going to require sustained attention might lose a lot of materials, are easily distracted, and can be forgetful. Some traits of the hyperactivity impulsiveness um, is somebody who is kind of on the move all the time. And I'm like, you can see my video. I'm moving my hands, um, fidgeting, squirming, having trouble staying in seat, uh, getting up and moving around when unexpected. For kids, They'll, it's, kids will run about and climb where it's inappropriate. As adults, most of us know when, when that's appropriate or not appropriate, but may still have that energy that's pent up and have a hard time like sitting in one of those little tiny desks in a lecture room. Hard, having a hard time engaging in quiet leisure activities may really just wanna engage with other people or do something physical. And 
sometimes we'll talk excessively. Um, these might be folks who blur out the answer. They're so excited to share that, you know, waiting for the professor to call on them, they might just say, blur out the answer um, or having trouble uh, waiting their turn or interrupting others because they don't want to forget what they're going to say because they get distracted. So they're like, I want to share right now so I don't forget. Um, so, some of the other criteria, this needs to have, have uh, a person needs to be having symptoms before age 12. It used to be younger and now they've moved it back to age 12 because again, some, some of the structure of school can mitigate some of these symptoms. Um, but so if somebody is going along in their lives and everything is, is fine and all of a sudden at age 20, they start developing these symptoms, it may not be ADHD, it may be something else. Something else could, have, could be causing trouble with focus and attention and um, hyperactivity that's not ADHD. So this is something that's present since childhood. The other thing is that these symptoms have to be happening in two or more settings. So if there's only these, these issues with attention at school, but not at work, not at home, not in social activities, then it might not be ADHD, right? If the only place, or like work, the only place the person's having issues is at work, maybe it's something about work um, and not necessarily ADHD, because this is pervasive. Like it, it touches all parts of, of a person's life and they can't like turn it on and turn it off. There can be, again, other reasons why a person could be having focus and attention issues in a, in a very specific setting. Also, just because somebody is, has some attention or hyperactivity, if it's not interfering, that's not a problem. It's when it actively interferes um, with a person's life, their social, academic, or occupational functioning, and it's not accounted for by other an, another um, um, issue like schizophrenia or another uh, psychotic disorder those folks are going to have a hard time with focus and attention as well, but it's totally different. Um, the other things that can, can look like it are like mood disorders, anxiety, disassociative identity disorder, or personality disorder. I'm going to touch more on things that can look like ADHD, but aren't necessarily later. Oh, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> so is it ADHD or is it a mood disorder? Uh, depression just like can bring a person down and it like impedes your prefrontal cortex same same it's the same thing with anxiety that it actually interferes with your prefrontal cortex which is where um, executive functioning thinking planning uh, self-regulation that stuff is is uh, managed by the prefrontal cortex and when things aren't working right in your brain it that kind of shuts that stuff down bipolar disorder in particular can look like ADHD. In bipolar, it's usually um, noted by having really, uh, having times where the person is like really uh, in a good mood and activated and can get a lot of stuff done and then uh, might have a period of depression. And so it, it can cycle up and down. So we have to be careful that, not we, because I don't do any diagnosis, but Sometimes it could be something like a mood disorder or bipolar disorder. Like I said, anxiety. Anxiety just eats up your whole working memory. And you can't pay attention if your working memory is busy, like, oh my gosh, I'm so worried about that upcoming thing that's gonna happen. And I'm, I wonder what's gonna happen. I'm having conflict with this person and playing that stuff over and over in your head. That's totally eating up your working memory. And then you're not able to actually engage and pay attention to what's happening around you in the moment. So that's something else that can look like um, ADHD. A learning disability can look like that because, you know, if you have a hard time, like if you have dyscalculia, which is a math disorder, sometimes, uh, especially children, will avoid the, uh, act the activities, they'll, they'll purposely not pay attention because it's hard and it's frustrating for them. So that's one of those signs when it's like, oh, the only time this person's having an issue is in math class or just in their reading class. That's when they investigate to see if it could be a learning disorder. Vision and hearing problems, right? So, oh, that person's not paying attention to me. They must be daydreaming. 
they could have a hearing impediment. And a lot of times people don't want to acknowledge that or they're really good at hiding that they're having a hearing issue. Uh, sensory processing disorder. So this is where the person has a hard time um, like integrating things in the environment and may be easily um, like uncomfortable from stimulation that's happening. And so they're distracted because of that kind of uh, stimulation rather than particularly ADHD. Autism spectrum disorders can also look like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And substance use specifically, well, alcohol absolutely can impair it, and marijuana. Marijuana also um, affects our focus and attention and our memory, makes it harder to move things into our long-term memory with, if you have chronic marijuana use. And then of course, sleep. Because there's so much that happens when we sleep at night, in terms of focus and attention and concentration and um, processing, when you are sleeping at night, besides all the great stuff that your brain and body does for you, um, the other thing that it does, when you're being stimulated during the day, let's pretend these are neurons, my hands are neurons, they are trying to make connections with each other. Um, but it's hard to do that while the brain's actively being stimulated. So at night, your brain does what's called memory consolidation, and it connects those neurons a little bit more solidly, and it does what's called synaptic pruning. So it cleans up the stuff that never connected. If you've ever pulled an all-nighter, the next day, you're like, you can't remember what happened the day before. It's hard to focus. Everything is distracting. Things get, your attention keeps getting pulled. I, I'll be honest, I didn't get as much sleep as I normally do last night. And I keep getting distracted because I'm getting um, alerts on my smartwatch and it's a little distracting while I'm trying to talk. Okay, so we want to make sure that sleep, if, if we can make sure that sleep is good so that memory consolidation and synaptic pruning can happen. Um, so a person might need to get like to rule out that there's another like sleep apnea or something like that going on. But like I said, some of these things happen in concert with ADHD. All right, so we're not entirely sure what causes this. Um, they've done research on environmental uh, environmental causes, and um, a lot of the research has discounted that. Most likely, they think it's biological, and they're not sure if it's from like a prenatal or a postnatal issue that's happened. Um, if it, it, they think it could be brain differences, and there seems to be a strong genetic connection where it's really common if parents have it, that children um, may have ADHD as well. Like I said, it's not uncommon for parents to be getting a diagnosis when they're taking their children in for an assessment. So one thing that they've noticed is that there's a difference in the neurotransmitters. So for serotonin, um, the, this neurotransmitter, it might be different, the level of serotonin in the person with ADHD's brain. The other one that they look at is dopamine, and it could be too low in the frontal lobes, in the frontal lobes, which is back here, and, the pre, and too high in the prefrontal lobes. And we've got a brain scan of a so-called normal brain, but so it's a scan of the activity, and then a brain with ADHD. So the, like the bright red is more activity, and the blue, the deep blue, is lower levels of activity. Now, we're not at the point yet of being able to do a brain scan and be able to diagnose somebody with a, with, you know, a, a mental health issue or ADHD. They're doing a lot of research on that. We're just not quite there yet. So I, I like this take on ADHD. We tend to think of it as a disorder nowadays but it's actually just a different way of being in the world. And so Tom Hartman calls it being a hunter in a farmer's world. And if you think about it back in the day, and I mean like ancient times, a hunter needs to be able to constantly monitor their environment and what is happening around them. They can react at moments notice and they're active when hot on the trail. There's stimulation and they're, they're tracking, um, their prey, they're trying to get ready for that. Those are, those are 
ADHD traits. And so that's highly valued in that kind of environment. But a farmer, oops, and they're willing to take risks as well. A farmer is not easily distracted. They are doing um, long-term stuff, you know, planting the seeds, tending the soil. It takes months and months before the plants are ready to grow and harvest to be eaten. Um, they're conscious of time. They're able to pace themselves. You know, very careful, not as likely to take risks. Okay. So while, of course, we're not farming, that's not what that means. But think about like what we're expected to do in modern society, like go sit in a classroom and be quiet for eight hours a day or whatever it is and have this highly structured schedule and go from place, you know, it just think about what, what we're expecting of people. And there's a different way of being in the world, right? And that, that actually has a huge advantage for us. We need people who are risk takers. We need people who can like think on a moment's notice. Um, folks with ADHD, if they are so inclined, make great ER doctors, okay? Because they, they like that stimulation, they can react quickly. So it's just a little bit different way of being in the world. Now, in terms of assessment, Learning services, so my office, and disability services, neither of our offices do any diagnosis of ADHD. You can get a list of referrals. Um, the disability services website is great and has a list of referrals. In fact, I'm gonna put that link in the chat for you guys right now. Let me send it to everybody. There we go. There, I would say their, their list is much up, more up to date than the list that I have, okay? Um, there is a service on campus that provides ADHD assessment. It is the Center for Psychological Services. So not CAPS, that's Counseling and Psychological Services. That is the um, office on campus that provides mental health therapy and group therapy. Um, for Mason students. The Center for Psychological Services serves the community here in Fairfax, and they do ADHD testing. So, but I always ask students, why, you know, what is it you hope to get out of testing? If a person just kind of wants to know and is maybe interested in um, medication, at, you know, possibly maybe trying medication, Check with your insurance first. It, it may be covered by health insurance. When I was back in the Midwest, we had we we did really well with being able to get students testing through their health insurance um, because it can be treated medically. If a person wants accommodations, academic accommodations, they need a full psychoeducational assessment. And if it's not offered through health insurance, it can be quite expensive. So if somebody's like, oh, I just want to know, even if they don't have it under their insurance, it's probably much cheaper to go see a psychiatrist for a couple of, of appointments rather than do the full battery of tests, okay? So the way, the, the way to properly assess ADHD, so before I was here at Mason, I was at Beloit College and I reviewed accommodation requests. So I never have assessed somebody, but I've read a lot of documentation. And what I was always looking for was a nice 360 evaluation, not like a 10 minute checklist from a pediatrician and then they wrote on their prescription pad, this person has ADHD. I was really looking for something more comprehensive. Um, so like I said, diagnosis by a physician, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And it should also include um, a social, medical, and family history, right? Because I said other things can interfere with your attention. So have they ruled out any vision or hearing issues or sleep issues? Um, is there something else going on? Was there a traumatic event that happened? That can also affect a person's focus and attention too. It should include a medical exam, some self-rating scales by the person, and then somebody who knows them really well, at least one or two other people who know the person well. And then sometimes they do what's called a continuous performance test. And that's what's in the picture here. So the person is looking at the screen and they're given instructions like, when you see the star, press this key. When you see the X, don't do anything. 
Um, and then there's a camera it got cut off on this particular picture, but at the top of that um, like computer, computer screen, there's a camera that's monitoring the person's movements. Sometimes they have like this little ankle strap that goes around your ankle to measure fidgeting, things like that. So it's looking at attention, impulsivity, and also that physical movement. It's a way that they're trying to like, um, to have like a, a specific measurement instead of more of these qualitative measures uh, of ADHD. Now, if you want academic accommodations, in addition to all that stuff I had on the previous slide, they're also going to be looking for um, an aptitude or intelligence assessment, an academic achievement assessment, and they may also look at information processing, how the person, and this is like a little screenshot, they might do like some memory tests and things like that. So the full psychoeducational assessment is quite expensive if you cannot get it covered by your health insurance, which is not to say you shouldn't do it, okay? Um, through, through Center for Psych Services, it is significantly less expensive than if you were to go to a private practice in, in, um, you know, in Virginia or DC or Maryland. All right, so the ways that they treat this, even though, like I said, I think it's just a different way of being in the world. Um, there's behavioral interventions um, and folks who had a diagnosis as children may have worked with a, um, a resource teacher or a learning specialist. They might've gone to a resource room and that person would help them break down their assignments or they might've worked with a, um, a classroom assistant. That person might be in the classroom to help redirect a student when they lose focus. So there's a lot of behavioral kind of activities, especially um, for young children. And then as folks get to be teenagers, they might just have like a resource room or um, a resource teacher, a person that they work with individually. Then there's medication. So folks who utilize medication tend to report that they are less impulsive, less restless, less distractible. Um, are able to be more productive, have better internal speech. So that's like our self-talk. Not everybody has internal speech, um, but this is something that's also positively impacted. Better self-control. So like not being so impulsive, like, oh, I think I'm just gonna go like buy all these things, you know, because you're, you have that impulse, the self-control is a little bit better. And tend to get in trouble, these folks tend to get in trouble less. All right, there's two categories of medication. Now, I am not a doctor or physician. I am sharing information with you that I looked up, but if you have questions about medication, you should talk to your doctor about that. There's two categories, psychostimulants and non-stimulants. Psychostimulants are probably the ones you've heard, you know, referred to the most often, like Adderall, we've got Ritalin and Concerta, Dexedrine, uh, Keo, I've never heard of this one. Um, the first three are the ones that, you know, the Ritalin, Concerta, and Adderall, the ones that most students who I work with who have ADHD tell me that they're taking. And Focalin, Focalin XR is one of the newer, I think one of the newer medications. Non-stimulants are things like Intuiv, Catapress, or it's, uh, that's the brand name, it's uh, clonidine is the generic name, Stratera, and Welbutrin. Welbutrin is an antidepressant, which has an off-label use of um, helping out with ADHD. Now, the psychostimulants are fast acting. So you can take it and then a few, within like 15 minutes or so, it starts to positively help with symptoms. With the non-stimulants, you have to take them for a couple of weeks consistently every day till they build up in your system. And that's when, that's when the person starts to see improvement. So it can be really hard to be patient and wait out that medication until it's you know, helping out. Um, the other thing is medications have to be adjusted, okay? 
So if you have a medical condition, you've ever, your doctor's ever started you on a medicine, they might say, we're going to start you on this dosage. And then we're going to have you come back and do some tests to see if that's effective. And if it's not, we're going to increase it. It's the same with ADHD. There's a little bit of trial and error because every person is different on what we react well to, what we don't react well to, what's helpful. So if you decide you want to try medication and you know, it, you don't like the first medication they gave you or it gives you weird side effects, um, talk to your doctor because like there's a whole bunch of other medications that a person could try. The other thing that's important to note um, about medication is that you should keep it, if you have a medication for ADHD treatment, you should keep it in the original pill bottle, especially the stimulants. They are controlled substances should also keep a letter from your doctor that lists the medication and the dosage and that you have a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, keep these things secured. Uh, don't keep them where somebody can easily get to them. There was a big thing. I'm sure it still happens now. I haven't heard about it as frequently, but there was a big market for people selling their Adderall to other students to make money and for those other students to take benefit of that stimulant medication. Never ever share your medication with somebody else. Um, stimulants tend to raise blood pressure, affect the heart and um, dampen appetite. So a person has to have a medical assessment to make sure that their heart, their cardiovascular system is in good shape before they can take something like a stimulant like Ritalin or Adderall. So don't share your medication with somebody else um, because it could cause some medical issues. That too, I have had students tell me, well, I must have ADHD because I took my friend's Ritalin and I was able to focus. It's a stimulant. It's gonna help everybody focus a little bit better. So there's too much risk. Go get assessed for yourself. Don't take your friend's medication. Go check, maybe something else is going on, um, but please, please, please be very careful uh, with your medication. So I'm going to take a breath and see if folks have, oh, I see there's a couple chats. I'm so sorry. Mia asked if these are the only symptoms. These are the, the symptoms uh, that are on the, um, um, oh my gosh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use to make diagnosis. So there's a more, I think I just kind of gave you the highlights. The, the DSM would have the full complete. And if you just look it up online, you should be able to find the complete, um, all the criteria. And you have to have multiple criteria. It's not just like one thing, it's having multiple of the criteria. And then it says like, I think it's like six in one category would be in attention and six in the hyperactivity impulse would be that. And if you had three in each, then it would be combined type. Like there's a whole breakdown. I didn't get into the weeds on that in this presentation. Um, but you can certainly look it up or talk to your doctor about that. So some issues that college students can face. Is one is difficulty with self regulation. So this is a fancy way of saying, you know, making yourself do your stuff, even when you don't want to. Okay. This is a good uh, skill to have. This is something that's going to help you in life and help you in your career and other aspects of life. Um, so it's pretty common that college students uh, need to work on their self-regulation. Like really so much has been directed by teachers and family members when we're younger. And then this is the first time when we're kind of responsible for ourselves. So it's really common. But for folks with ADHD, it's, it's very hard for them to learn these skills. So time management, it can be an issue. Procrastination, poor planning or no planning at all. Um, low motivation, low concentration. Like I said, this is pretty common, especially when we very first go away to college. Um, but it's exacerbated for folks with ADHD. Like it's, it's more than what the average, if you will, student experiences. Again, can, it can result in some social activities, um, being impulsive, speaking out of turn, um, or having delayed response, right? They're asked, somebody's asked a question, but they're like distracted by something else. It might take a minute for them to like, oh, oh, you're, you're talking to me? Oh, I'm sorry. 
um, following through, keeping promises on things, and that can cause conflict with others. So there's this whole idea that folks with ADHD are more under control of the moment, like nothing else exists except for what is happening right now. Not the stuff that, you know, not my assignment that's due in two weeks, not, you know, changing the oil on my car, not that kind of stuff. It's like what's happening right now in the moment. Then there's also this thing called hyperfocus. Now, when my nephew was younger, before I knew anything about ADHD. And my sister's like, I think he might have ADHD. I'm like, he can't because he sits, plays video games for hours on end. You can't have ADHD if you can like sit there and do an activity for a long period of time. Well, now I know I was wrong because there's something called hyperfocus. When somebody is really stimulated and really interested, they can get into this hyperfocus mode um, where they're just like in it to the point where they will ignore other things, maybe not, in, you know, not eat a meal, they'll skip a meal, not realize people are talking to them or getting very upset if that activity is interrupted. So I mentioned video games because that's really common. Video games are extremely stimulating to the brain and they provide a lot of rewards in our brain when we're engaging in video games. But it can be any activity that somebody really enjoys whether that's athletic activities, like my niece, oh, she's all over the place with her gymnastics. Like it's hard to get her to come back from that because she's like really engaged in those activities. Um, for other people, it might be reading. It, it can be any number of things. It's just, if it's something that the person enjoys, it may be hard for them to, it's not so much of an issue of attention, it's an issue of managing the attention and being able to put the attention on the thing that the person wants to in the moment that they wanna do it. So it's like, oh, I know I need to do my work, but this is really stimulating, I'm gonna stay over here and having a hard time pulling themselves away from that activity. Folks can also tend to be really creative because they're not locked into one you know, logical way of thinking about things. They can be really creative and have lots of energy and lots of charisma too. Students with ADHD can be very charismatic and energetic and fun to be around. Now, something called executive functioning. This is like your planning, time management, kind of part of your, the brain is impacted. And I have this quote from Ed Hollowell. He is a medical doctor who has ADHD and he wrote this wonderful book called Delivered from Distraction. And I think he's got a couple of sequels to that. No matter how much you want to force yourself to pay attention, boredom allows curiosity to find the key and open the dungeon door, allowing attention to escape and find some interesting place to visit. Okay, so executive functioning is things like activation, like all right, I need to be doing this activity right now and I need to get started on it. Starting on it is really hard. Maintaining focus during the activity is, is a challenge. Um, maintaining effort. So a person might be able to start something, but being able to continue and finish it can be hard. They may also have trouble managing their emotions. So like I said, if there's a class or an activity or an assignment that a person really doesn't like, they may have trouble managing their emotions around that. And if emotions take over, it's hard to focus to do the work. If you're not paying attention, your memory is not gonna be formed, okay? So memory and attention and focus are all tied together. And then taking action, following through on things uh, is impacted as well. So if these kinds of attention issues are impacting you, there's a few things you can do for, in terms of communicating with others. When you're communicating with somebody, strive to make eye contact with them. Having that eye contact makes it a, le a little bit easier to focus and pay attention rather than allowing uh, yourself to look around because then you'll see something off in the just like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, there's, what's going on? Oh, what kind of equipment are they bringing in to, to do construction today? Ooh. So try to make eye contact with the individual that you're talking to. Ask for them to give you instructions one step at a time. So if it's a professor, maybe ask the professor, hey, professor, can you, can you break that down for us? Maybe could you write it on the, on the whiteboard for us? Um, break it down. 
And then if you're talking one on one, repeat the instructions back to them. So what I understand I need to do is this, this and this. OK, so it's my turn to clean the apartment. And what I the first thing I need to do is to scrub the floors, which actually, no, I always do the floors last. But I need to scrub the counters and then sweep the floors and then mop them. Yes, yes. And you get you get uh, acknowledgement. You might write a, a little summary down or might write a little bullet point so you can remember what would happen in the in the conversation. And add some visual aids, adding color or pictures. You can color code things in your life. So like, oh, here are chores that I need to do. Here are errands. Here are some schoolwork. Um, I love color coding classes in schedules because it, it's just a nice little shortcut for our brain because our brains are lazy. Everybody's brain, not just folks with attention issues. Everybody's brains are lazy. Some strategies to organize yourself. You want to have a designated folder or whether that is a hard copy folder or a virtual folder like a digital folder um, and a notebook or forms for each class. Don't intermingle all of your materials because like, oh, I'm just going to throw all of my coursework in one digital folder. But it's going to be so hard to find what you need, especially if you don't have a naming uh, like a set naming scheme. So make a, a digital folder for each class. And anytime you get downloads from the class, put those in that folder or homework that you produce. And you might even have a couple subfolders. Don't go crazy. You don't want to have 5 million folders. But definitely strive to put the coursework in the proper folder or your notes. If you type your notes, put your notes in that digital folder. If you are doing handwritten notes, have a spiral notebook or binder, whatever you use, one section per class. Don't intermingle them. It takes a long time to sort that out when you're trying to study. So make it easy on yourself. Five subject notebook, one section for each class. Have a place for everything and everything in its place, right? So organize your cabinets, your drawers, right? So like my dresser is very organized. Uh, my sister's dresser is like very disorganized or stuff everywhere but like I have a drawer for short sleeve t-shirts and a drawer for long sleeve t-shirts and a drawer for um uh like workout pants and things like that like and they're folded in a certain way um and it took a lot while to like get in that system but it makes it so much easier like oh I need a green t-shirt because it's Friday and it's Mason Colors Day. It's very easy for me to find that. It takes a little setup and if you need help, ask somebody who's good at organization to help you organize some spaces. We want to have a system where you touch things once so you don't want to have stuff where you like, oh, I'm going to set this here on my desk and I'm going to move it to my bed and I'm going to move it over to this other area. Try to have a system in place where like, oh, here's my junk mail. My junk mail goes in the recycling. Here's my bills. I pay my bills and I file them away. So whatever your system is, just try to have something in place. And then I really like this one, this strategy, have a launch pad slash landing pad. So in my home, I have a designated place for um, like my keys and things like that. So when I come home, it's my landing pad and I go and I hang my keys up and I have certain things that I take out of my 15 million pockets and I put them in a specific location. And then when it's time to go to work in the morning, I go to that launch pad and grab all of my materials that I need for the day. So like you might have your backpack set up ready to go and you set your backpack by the front door along with your keys, your water cup and you know a reminder note to pick up grab your lunch before you leave to go to campus. All right. But it's just nice like like I said my sister she's a little bit more disorganized and she's like she's like where's my purse? Where's my purse? Sometimes it's hanging on the banister. Sometimes we find it in the bathroom. Sometimes she left it in the car. So just have a place like that's where those important things live. It doesn't have to be everything. It's just like your essential stuff you take with you for the day. Um, and then in terms of learning, try to have a place that is dedicated specifically to learning and studying and make sure it's clear of clutter, right? So we don't wanna have it like where you're sharing your gaming space with your study space. Try to make those two separate spaces um, during last year when most people were doing classes at Mason from home um, with some students what we did was we had a dedicated 
computer for schoolwork, and then a dedicated computer for social media and games. And just having that what helps with that mental switch of, oh, I'm on this computer, this is my schoolwork computer. So we had like no links on there, no gaming, disabled all alerts, that kind of stuff. So the person wouldn't get distracted. Time management. Okay, so you said Vicki, there's a hard time, people have a hard time with executive functioning and planning and activating. What are some things we can do? First, I recommend this to everybody. Take all of your syllabi, read through them and identify the big stuff your exams, papers, projects, presentations, big stuff, things that are gonna take you a couple of days maybe to work on, not something, not like a reading assignment or a quick dis discussion board post, um, just the big stuff and put them onto a calendar, a monthly calendar. Don't just make a list because the problem with the list is we cannot see the passage of time. It's super easy to procrastinate. And then even if you just look at each syllabus, Individually, they look like they're pretty manageable. Oh, this class has three exams. Oh, this class has a couple projects and a couple papers. No problem. Multiply that by five. And then you realize, oh my gosh, like, hello, it's October 1st. Probably if you haven't had your first exam, your first exam is coming very soon because it, we're getting to be about a third of the way through the semester. And it seems like, oh my God, all the professors conspired to make exams at the same time. No, that's not what happens. It's like there's natural points in the semester to have an assessment and they tend to overlap. So plot them on a calendar so you can see when your busy times are. You should also put important other important things like if you have concert tickets or you're going to go travel on a weekend, you're going to go travel up to New York City, you know, take the, um, oh, I forget what the, the bus is called, but take the bus up to New York City for the weekend. Mark that off on your calendar so you know I don't have that time available to study. Have a weekly master schedule with just your routine, not scheduling every minute of every day. Instead, write your when your classes are, your job is, your meetings. I know you probably at this point in the semester have your schedule memorized, but there's something really helpful about being able to see it. Okay, so now we know when our big due dates are, we know what our weekly routine looks like. And then the next level of time management we want to think about is the day. What tasks are we going to work on each day? Um, so with this, what you do is you think about two to three goals for the week, and they can be big, hairy goals, like prepare for this exam, work on my class presentation. But besides those things, you still have other things to keep up with for class, like discussion board posts and reading assignments. So then what you do is you um, determine two or three important tasks to work on each day, and you plan seven days out. This is a big adjustment for a lot of students. Most people are used to just planning like what's due tomorrow. And that works well in high school, does not work so well in college. Even if you could do it for like your 100 and 200 level classes, when you get to be a junior and senior, the projects become bigger and more longer term. So you need to start learning to plan to break those assignments down and do them over time. There's a whole workshop on scheduling and time management, or you can make an appointment with one of us um, so I'm just briefly touching on this. There's way more information about this. Try to break a big assignment into smaller parts. Sometimes we procrastinate because something is too big and it's overwhelming. So read the assignment and think, what could I do? Well, even before that, what can I do in two minutes? Well, I can read the assignment. All right. And then what could I do in the next two minutes? Okay, I can maybe think and brainstorm about a topic. So break it down into like little tiny steps, little tiny pieces, and you'll chip away at that. Again, we can help you in learning services with that process. Um, there's this metaphor called eat the frog. If you imagine that you have to eat a frog every single day and there is no getting out of it, you have to eat that frog. You wanna eat your frog early in the day. The reason for this is when we don't like a task, when we, when like maybe it's a class, it's not our favorite class, or we don't like a particular assignment, we tend to put it off. And we put it off till the end of the day when we are at our worst. Instead, you should try to do it early in the day when you are at your best and get it out of the way. Because otherwise, if you're trying to eat that frog at the end of the day, all you're gonna think about all day long is that dreaded task. All right, instead flip it, 
do it first, get it out of the way. And then it's like your other homework or assignments or activities are, are like, you know, they're like a reward and you have 24 hours. You don't have to think about that task again. Okay. So move those tasks, get them done. You don't have to do it. You don't have to get up at five in the morning and do it, but it should be a priority to get it done. Like first thing and get it out of the way. Um, Parkinson's law says that work will expand to fill however much time is allotted for it. So instead of being like, oh, that assignment is due in two weeks, I'll get started on it the day before. Instead, give yourself some deadlines in between and you can easily break some things down and to be like, okay, well, I wanna make sure that I have my topic picked by this date. And I wanna make sure that I have three sources that I have read by this date. And you can break it down. So if you need like 10 sources for your final project, you know, I can do three a day for the next three days. And then I have one more than I need to locate. That's pretty manageable. Instead of thinking, oh my God, I have to sit here and find 10 sources, read them all, analyze them, write everything up. Okay. So give yourself little deadlines. I'm, by this date, I'm going to have a um, outline. The other thing that's good for accountability is to make an appointment with the writing center, you know, several like a ways before that assignment is due. They'll help you in any stage of the writing process. Um, so you could just show up and be like, I have no idea how to do a lit review or I don't understand how to do this assignment. That's that's OK. But for me, I get a little social pressure and don't want to walk in empty handed. So it usually prompts me to start on a writing assignment. Um, and you can get, I think, 15 writing center appointments um, during each semester. So that's like one, one uh, appointment a week. So that can be really good for accountability. If you have an appointment or you need to set a reminder, add it to your phone right away and put that alert on there immediately. Like when I'm making an appointment at the doctor's office, they're like, okay, you're all set, bye. I'm like, hang on, well, let me put it on my schedule. Let me set my alarm. Because if I don't, and I set multiple alarms for anything that's unusual, a week before, a day before, an hour before, because I know I'm gonna forget about it. I'm, I like routine and then if something is different, it totally throws me off. All right, so some things you can do for concentration. If you are in class, sit towards the front of the classroom. That way there are fewer distractions between you and the professor, all right? Because then you can see other people that what's happening, sit closer to the front. Um, a smart pen, now there's other ways to do this now that are, that are getting more common. Like there are note-taking apps um, where you can use like a digital pen to write on your phone or a tablet um, that you can also audio record the, the lecture and it'll sync it up. But if you're old school and you want to write on paper, there's something called a smart pen. And the smart pen, you use micro dot paper. And there's a little picture of it here. The pen itself has a camera in the tip of the pen and a digital audio recorder in the body of the pen. So when you go to class, there's, it look, there's like a little control thing at the bottom of the page. Like it's just a picture, but you literally tap on it with your pen and it will start to record. And as you write, it is syncing up what you're writing with the audio. So if you have 10 minutes that you started daydreaming during class, you can leave a few blank lines in your notes. And then after the lecture, go back and tap on your notes and it will play that section that you missed. So it's beautiful. You don't have to go back and listen to like a two hour and 40 minute lecture to find the piece that you missed. You can just listen to the portion that you, that, that you weren't paying attention. Now, you should ask for permission before you record a class. Um, the professor owns that material. It's up to them to decide if it's okay to record or not. And some classes, it's not really appropriate to record. Like if you're taking uh, like a psychology class or a counseling class and people are practicing therapy techniques, we don't, people don't want to record those kinds of things, okay? So please be mindful and respectful. But this is something, if somebody has a diagnosis, they might be able to ask for as an accommodation. There's uh, an option on Adobe Reader. So if you have a PDF, you can activate what's called Read Out Loud and have the PDF, have the computer read the PDF to you out loud. You should still follow along and read with your eyes. But for some students, having that visual and auditory stimulation helps their focus and attention. 
There's another program called Read and Write Gold that you can download through the Assistive Technology website here at Mason. Fidgeting. When we were kids, our teachers would say, stop fidgeting, stop moving, you have to sit still. The research shows that fidgeting and physical movement helps increase focus and attention. So fidget if you need to, stand up when you read, um, move, move yourself around, you know, put your laptop on top of a box and do your schoolwork because you don't have to sit in one place. Um, just make sure you pick a fidget that's not going to distract people like in the library. So don't think tap your pen or something like that. Having study partners. You know, if you're going to talk, you can talk through the learning with somebody. Learning doesn't have to be boring and it doesn't have to be solitary. It doesn't have to be like, oh, like a monk. Oh, I'm sitting, you know, in like, you know, all by myself with the walls closed. No, have a study partner or form a study group and try to make the learning fun. You can socialize a little, but make sure that the focus is ultimately on learning the material. Um, a concentration score sheet is what you do when you're like, okay, I want to try and get some work done. Let me see how many times I get distracted during this work session. So you just put like a little tick mark or a check mark each time you get distracted, and then you count them up and you go, okay, now I'm going to do another round. Let me see if I can reduce the number of check marks. A worry pad is someplace where you would write down any intrusive thoughts when you're trying to learn and study. Um, like, oh, don't forget to do this. Oh, I have to pick up milk. I have to jot it down and say I can worry about that later after my study session is over. Re actually write down your goals. That way if you get off track you can remind yourself oh yeah I'm supposed to be working on my paper today. Exercise has been shown to increase blood flow um, to the brain, increase attention, uh, promote neurogenesis which is a fancy way of saying grow more neurons. Um, it, is, it has been shown to help relieve stress uh, and help with focus and concentration in folks with ADHD. So exercise is good for everybody and it is especially good for folks with ADHD. You don't have to run a marathon, a 20 minute walk every day, playing a pickup game of basketball, engaging in yoga. Um, did you know that you can take a recreation class for one credit here at Mason? So if you're enrolled in 14 credit hours, 15 is the same amount of money. You don't pay extra tuition for 15 credits. So if you have a semester that's like that, you could sign up for Taekwondo or bowling or yoga or some other activity that's offered here through Mason. And then you know like, oh, at least you're gonna have a couple times a week that you're gonna go and get some exercise. Have a balanced diet. It's important to have protein, um, carbs and fats and not just have like, all carbs. We want to have some protein so that it helps sustain our energy levels. And of course, good sleep hygiene. Even though it's challenging to sleep with ADHD, trying to have a good, you know, of a consistent bedtime and a consistent wake time. For most of us, we need about eight hours of sleep at night. But let's say you only get seven a night. By the end of the week, you are seven hours sleep deprived and you can't make that up. So try to maintain a good sleep routine. Meditation has also been shown to help focus and attention because you practice focusing. All right, some, some campus resources that are available to help folks if they're having some attention and concentration issues. Um, there's the Center for Psychological Services, like I had mentioned. They, um, it's listed on here, their, their location and their web address is psych psychclinic.gmu.edu and they can provide an ADHD assessment. The Assistive Technology Inst Initiative is um, a resource on campus that helps with technology needs and you do not have to be registered with disability services. They are dedicated to helping anybody at Mason who needs help it, it, when it can be helped with technology. Now there's some services that are limited to students with disabilities, but for the most part, they um, will provide some technology support. So check out their webpage, ati.gmu.edu. That's where you can download that read and write software. So read and write will read like a web page to you. It, they've got some features in there that can help with writing papers. Um, they can teach you how to use a smart pen. Um, so check that out. That's a great resource. 
Disability Services is located on the second floor of sub one. And um, if you are interested in registering um, for accommodations, you can make an appointment with them by calling or going to their webpage. So they would provide students with a letter at the beginning of each semester for their professors that says this student is eligible for the following accommodations. The letter does not say what the person's diagnosis is at all. And the student gets to decide which professor they're going to give that letter to. So a student might decide, you know, I really need extended time on my exams in math class, but there's not really exams in English, so I'm not going to provide that professor with this letter. Okay, so it, it, the student has a lot of control of how that's managed. I know sometimes students come to college and they're like, uh, I, I don't want to be known as that kid that had to go to the testing center or who had to do X, Y, or Z. I want a fresh start. I encourage people to still register. You don't have to use the accommodations, but you also get early registration. Okay, so there's a benefit of that. And then if you do decide halfway through the semester, oh, I do need that accommodation, they're already in place rather than trying to scramble like, oh my gosh, now I need to try and figure out how to get them my documentation and, and get that meeting and get those letters for my exam that's in two days. All right, better to get that in place and then not need it than to try and do it last minute. And then of course there's learning services. And I was mentioning that we provide academic coaching to students as well as the academic success workshops. Um, so accommodations are determined on a case by case basis. But the typical ones that I've seen for folks with attention issues may include things like extended time on an exam, because it may take a little longer to, to process and think through, and the person may be easily distracted, so things just take a little bit longer. Maybe a reduced distraction area for exams. So it can be hard in a big lecture room and people are like making noise and moving around and maybe somebody gets up and goes turns in their exam. That can be disruptive for a student with attention issues. So we do have um, testing rooms. They're actually also here in sub one that um, the student would make arrangements with disability services to use that space and take the exam in that um, in the one of the exam rooms here person might be able to get permission to record during class, may be able to get a copy of the professor's notes or PowerPoint slides in advance. So like I know in my class, I don't re release my PowerPoint slides before class, um, but if a student needed that as an accommodation, I certainly would provide that. Might be able to get an assignment early. Now you can request extended time on assignments. Me personally, I do not, I do not recommend this as an accommodation. One of the big challenges with ADHD is chronic procrastination. And what I found is if somebody has extensions on assignments, they tend to procrastinate to the new deadline. So it doesn't really help the student in the long run. And then all the work starts piling up, right? Because, oh, assignment number one was due, but I got an extension on it. So I've got three extra days to work on it. Oh, but I'm supposed to be working on assignment number two. And now that's getting pushed back because I haven't started on that yet. And my work in my other classes is getting pushed back. So really, it would be better to get assignment instructions early so you can try and start on them early. Um, and then also it's trying to have other folks help hold you accountable, like making a writing center appointment because they're going to ask you about it, making an academic coaching appointment because we'll help hold you accountable to that. All right, so some online resources, uh, chad.org is a great website, um, Attitude Magazine. So it has information both about ADHD in children and ADHD in adults, which not everybody recognizes. I think Chad has a lot of, a lot of information. It does have some stuff for adults, but Attitude Magazine definitely offers some information. There's add.org and um, totallyadd.com is another um, online resource. Ooh, look at that, I'm one minute over, I apologize. But if you guys wouldn't mind filling out an evaluation of today's session, um, I've got the QR code on the screen, you can scan it. I talked a lot in this workshop, I am so sorry. This is one of those workshops that I really would rather do in person and that we like move around the room. It's a little harder to get through all of this information. Um, 
in an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but I also don't want to make it longer because we used to have two hour long workshops and it is, that's like co completely opposite, right? We don't want to have too long. So I hope that this information was helpful to you. And I'm going to drop that link for the evaluation in the chat as well. Okay, so it's a, a fairly short evaluation. If you guys wouldn't mind filling it out and giving me some feedback, I would really appreciate it. But I'm going to hang out and see if anybody has any questions. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned the part about kind of forgetfulness. Say, for example, um, different settings, but what if you have maybe like a certain forgetness in like a certain area, but then in another area you don't forget? For example, say you're not only really forgetful in education, but when it comes to like your personal life, you can be pretty forgetful. Does that mean anything or does that make sense? It, it does. Well, and it, 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 it kind of depends, right? So I would look at first what kinds of things are easily remembered and what kinds of things are easily forgotten, right? There might be some circumstances in, in the educational environment that help the person remember and different circumstances in the personal life that makes it harder, right? So like in education, maybe it's, hey, everything's on Blackboard. So even if I forget, I can go look it up. Well, real life does not have Blackboard available to go look something up. So is it something related to that? That's a great question. I, I would need like more information. And I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing that information in this environment. So that might be something good to talk through with a coach. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. How about other questions? What not how about what other questions do folks have? So it might be good in the chat. Yeah, it could be related to hyper focus too that you're hyper-focused in one environment. You're welcome. So Nat Yelly in the chat, noted that if anybody wants to talk or rant, please feel free to message them. And they've left their um, their phone number. You're welcome, Julia. Um, I guess I have a question. One of my biggest troubles is that activating. Yes. Do you have any tips for that? <laughs> yeah, there's a few things. One, have a location that you go to that it helps put you in the mindset of that activity that you need to do okay so for example it's very hard for a lot of us to do our work at home because we're at home but if i go to the library or i go to the study area something about being in that environment can help now the hard part is getting yourself to go there right so you might need to set up an external reward for example I used to have to teach my class on the way other side of campus. And I was like, man, I hate going it. But we had Auntie Anne's on campus at the time. So I'd say, well, after I teach class, I can stop and get an Auntie Anne's pretzel. And having like that little incentive afterwards, that made it a little bit easier. So part of it is go to an environment that puts you in that mindset. The other thing, like the Pomodoro timer method can help kick in that that little kick of adrenaline, that can help. Uh, another is to have another person that you are, you have set a time to work together, not necessarily on, even on the same thing, but just like have, having a friend that you're accountable to, to say, okay, well, we're gonna meet up in the library. We're gonna get a, a library study room. We're gonna meet up. And it's a lot easier if it's like just me, it's easy for me to blow it off and be like, whatever, it's raining. I'm not going out today. But my friend's going to be mad if I don't show up at the library to study with her. And so having that accountability piece where you don't even have to be working on the same activity, but the same studying the same thing, but just saying, like, we're going to get together. We're going to sit in in the study room for like an hour and we're going to do some work together. That can be another way that, that to help with activation. Does that help? Yeah, a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Mackenzie. 
So um, I found the information in this um, to be really helpful. Um, one thing that I've done in the past that kind of helps me out a lot is there's like um, browser extensions and apps which can be used to um, block uh, websites and other like distracting um, like apps on, on your phone or websites on your browser. Um, in particular, I use one called um, Leech Block, which is a free browser extension um, that you can set up to block certain websites at um, certain times. And it's really customizable so that you can set it up so that you can, um, so that if you need to like override it for whatever reason, you can, um, like if you if you absolutely need to visit a certain website for whatever reason, you can override it by putting in like a a long string of, string of like numbers and letters that it gives you, mm -hmm. um, or you can set it up to just completely um, put put you in lock lockdown for a few hours if you just need to stay away from it. So That's I just thought I would be bring that up. Thank you so much for mentioning it. It sounds like it's really, really, really helpful because our phones are totally designed to distract us and get our attention. And it gives us like a nice little hit of, you know, positive hormones in our brain when we like, you know, it reinforces like click, click, click. So to not have those temptations, it's got to be incredibly powerful. I really appreciate you sharing that. Yep. And Julia shared an app, um, four step. Yeah, hi. So I actually just started using it where just like the Leech app, um, but it's specifically for your phone and you go into the app and you set the time that you want to have blocked off. And you're like, it's like a game basically where you're planting trees. And so if you leave that app or if it notes, if it um, is aware of you going to other apps, your tree dies and you have to start over. I get it. It's forest app. I totally did. I was like trying to break it down. I'm like, what is that forest app? Oh, that sounds really cute. So if you open the link I just sent and you scroll down, it kind of shows you what happens. So whenever you want to stay focused, you plant a tree and it will grow while you focus on your work. And then if you leave the app, your tree will die. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. So it's been helping me a bit. Yes, and Mackenzie posted the, the name of Leech Block. I have heard of that. It's fun. People find it helpful. What other questions or comments do you guys have? Okay. Wow, this is really nice to have people. I'm so sorry we went a little bit over, but um, the fact you guys stayed a little bit to, to, to chat a little, that's really nice. So I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. And we are here if you need any assistance. Um, feel free to contact me if you have any questions, but have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Wilson. Bye, Julia. You too, Mackenzie.